Hello, I'm composer Kevin Putz, and I'm very happy today to be able to talk to you about my string quartet called Credo, uh, written for the Miro String Quartet, and performed here by uh, at Chamber Music Tulsa. Um, the string quartet, I would say, is for composers um, a rather intimidating medium um, because there has been such uh, an incredible body of repertoire written by the greatest composers who have who have lived, um, and the question I guess comes up for every composer: Well, why why write more? Um, except that someone ask ask you to write more. <laughs> so um, you know, for me, my first string quartet was written in 1999 for the uh, the Ying Quartet, and um, it was. A reaction to the um, devastating Columbine uh, s school shooting, um, which had just occurred, and um, and I guess began a kind of pattern of uh, of such violence in our country. So, my string quartets have always been about rather weighty subjects. Um, have have referenced those subjects, um, and have been my way of. Uh, expressing my own feelings about them uh, through the music. Credo was written, I think, in 2005 or six, um, around there, and it was commissioned by the Miro String Quartet. We had uh, not grown up together as musicians, but we had gotten to know each other through um, the University of Texas at Austin, where, uh, where I was teaching. That was my first teaching job, and the Miro Quartet uh, arrived there as the quartet in residence um, around the time I was ending my tenure at, at University of Texas, Texas, but we overlapped by a bit. And I was so grateful for them, uh, for, for their asking for this quartet um, from me. It was, it was an honor because, of course, I knew their, their work and their, their incredible um, musicianship and virtuosity as an ensemble. Um, so... They, I remember what they wanted was, um, I think they were doing, putting together two groups of pieces or two concerts. Um, and one aspect was the darker side of America. Um, and one was about the lighter side. And they asked me to do something um, based on the lighter side. And <laughs> I guess maybe I focused on the wrong things, but at the time, and certainly Still today, I would say it's rather difficult um, to do that when um, there are so many serious things happening, so, so many alarming um, things happening. And uh, in 2005, uh, I guess I felt no difference. So my solution was to look to my own experiences uh, rather than to sort of look at the news and, and, you know, what are the big events happening or what are the things that, uh, you know, in general we can feel positive about. I looked, I just started to notice uh, my own experiences and I thought maybe I could put them together into some kind of musical tapestry. Um, I could weave, weave them together, first finding uh, musical inspiration, or musical representation of each of those experiences and then putting them together into some kind of either multi-movement piece or a single movement piece um, in which they would all uh, be woven together in some hopefully coherent way. So, I, so that's what I did. Um, and um, the first moment like this which occurred to me was a time when I was uh, at um, a violin maker's shop uh, in Katona, New York, not too far uh, north of where we live. And I was there with my wife who's a violinist. And she had a problem with her violin which was indiscernible to me. It sounded great to me but uh, something that she needed to have fixed. And I remember just being in this um, in this this shop, this this specialist uh, shop, and seeing the 
stringed instruments, uh, sort of the hollow bodies of, of instruments hanging from the ceiling and the whole kind of world of, of playing a stringed instrument at the very highest level was something that I found very encouraging, inspiring, um, kind of life affirming, um, that there was this little subculture, not even of, of the world, but of even of the, of the music field, where the slightest movement of the bridge or on, on the instrument, I mean, on the, on the violin, could make all the difference in sound to those who, who care most deeply about it. It was just a kind of a, an amazing um, thing to see, to, to witness, and, and just to be along, along for this, uh, to, to watch this happen. So that's one, that's one uh, moment. Another time I was uh, hearing my music performed in Pittsburgh, and I was jogging along the, one of the rivers there, and under, I was underneath these massive um, suspension bridges. And again, I was sort of awestruck by this. I was just like, well, it's, it's you know, there are all these problems with bridges and, and <laughs> highways and, and mass transit that we have. On the other hand, it's quite amazing that as humans, we've, we've been able to engineer this, um, to engineer these massive structures, which get us from place to place from, you know, over rivers and across our country. And so I thought of something, I, you know, I had one of those visions of, of those movies where it's like time lapse and, and the headlights are going really fast. And I was thinking of some music that might, uh, might represent that. Um, and then the one, the third kind of little vignette personal experience that I, I thought I could put into music um, was a time when I was composing in my studio when I first moved to New York. This was back in 2005, actually when I was writing the piece. Um, and I looked across, so I looked out my window and across the street um, when, when uh, we were living in New York City. And I saw through the window of the person across the street, uh, the apartment across the street, um, it looked like um, a mother, you know, like teaching her daughter how to dance. They were just sort of dancing and sort of, it was a, uh, I'm not sure what kind of dancing it was, but um, that was a very beautiful moment to witness, um, even briefly. Um, so I thought that that kind of, um, that could also be a kind of music which I could um, include in this piece and because it would be very different from what I was imagining for the other types of, of pieces. So with those, th those things in mind, um, I think I went ahead and started um, to try to put together some kind of narrative, which I thought might, um, might make sense um, and make musical sense. And so I began with my memory of this luthier, this violin shop, and the kind of airiness of these stringed instruments hanging from the ceiling. And, and what, you know, a composer hears when you look at stringed instruments is like the overtones, you know, the open strings of the instruments. And, and the, the overtones of those and the harmonics that can be produced from those. And so I, I began with a kind of representation of that kind of a a, a polyphony of, of these overtones played by the whole string quartet, um, a kind of complicated uh, maneuvering through many of these harmonics. Um, and then a very simple, um, uh, a very simple melody played over sustained notes in two of the instruments. So this all kind of fades away and then these two notes and then and then the first violinist and the first section of this piece which I call the violin guru of Katona that's the first movement the first section there's a simple melody then the violin first violin sort of a nostalgic um, kind of sad melody and then a repeat of these these harmonics that are hanging in the air, kind of the centuries, I think almost like the, the history of, of these string instruments that goes you know, back 400, 500 years. 
that history kind of hanging in the air. And, um, and that's the first, uh, the first section, very much about the first violinist leading this, this um, ensemble. As I was thinking of my wife and, and, her, um, uh, and her instrument and her working with, uh, with this, uh, this craftsman to, to perfect her instrument. And, and eventually we come to a kind of a chorale that's played by all the other members of the group, so not the first violinist. So. simple kind of almost like an accordion um, um, chorale keeps repeating while the first violinist kind of tunes this instrument and then in this case Daniel Ching the wonderful Daniel Ching um, tunes his instrument and then begins to kind of play excerpts you know from that you know sort of trying out the instrument which is exactly what happened at this shop um, my wife played the various things in the repertoire just to try out the instrument and show him kind of how it was sounding. So you hear some, some Bach, I won't play it, some Sibelius. And, um, and then kind of back to where we started um, with these, these harmonics, which I almost think of in this piece like a sort of a prism or a portal from one section to another. Um, it's a kind of a transitional... Uh, timbral world from one section to another and so then I thought well this 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 movement has been kind of hanging in the air and kind of um, lyrical and and slower so I thought well maybe I could write a movement about what I experienced in in Pittsburgh and, and with these these massive bridges overhead and and um about about transit and um, or about infrastructure. I decided to call it infrastructure. So that, that's the second part, and it's like as different from the first as as you can get. And of course, this is one of the the things that's most challenging about writing a string quartet because you have four instruments that are all essentially the same timbre. So creating variety uh, within that, in other words, having a, a sense of different chapters in this movement um, or in this in this piece. Um, is challenging, and so you have to call on all the all the other aspects besides besides timbre. Although even there are even timbral kind of variations that can be used within the quartet. But essentially, you've got to rely on everything else, like texture and harmony and register and and um, and rhythm and uh, you know meter and all kinds of things to to make it feel like there are different sections. And I really wanted this second section about about motion and and. And transit and, and you know the systems by which we get across the country um, to feel different so it begins with with um, the first violinist playing a very quick very quick 16th note um, sorry I can't play it's too hard uh, it's more of a string thing but it's 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 a very energetic group of, of 16th notes um, I'll try it again it's faster than that. And that is repeated with these kind of sustained um, chords. And then three of the instruments play that, this in unison, a much longer version of that, which kind of keeps going, just keeps moving. And then eventually um, the whole quartet plays it in canon. So if you imagine, I'll play it really slowly. faster it's like -da 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 like that to go one two three four imagine the whole string quartet playing this that that pattern of 16th notes but all at slightly different times so like one of them plays here and then one of them plays like an eighth note later and then the viola is played like another eighth later so the thing will start to feel like not just one car or train but many like a lot of activity and then a melody kind of emerges, uh, like a, a duet almost emerges from that, um, that texture, which is very, very fast. And, um, and that's, that, that's that section. That's the, what I call infrastructure. It's very quick. And I would say, in general, lower, like in the middle of the, of the, the register, like the middle of the piano kind of thing. I mean, it, there are some times when there are some kind of angular melodies in it, um, like 
Um. I'm trying to I'm trying to get the sense of like you know huge swooping structures, um, but even during those moments you hear like still these sixteenth notes moving ahead um, in the other instruments. So that's that movement. And then I thought of this other experience I had with with this you know this beautiful kind of window into someone else's life, <laughs> um, where uh, this sort of dancing lesson and um, how that could be how that could be presented in this piece. Um, and I thought it could almost um, be presented or sort of emerge as a window, as, as, as if this fast music was going along and suddenly it's sort of faded out and the new music faded in as if it's almost a window in the piece. And it's a very simple lilting, um, simple lilting kind of dance like um, section of the piece um, where where two instruments are always playing that melody and then the cello and the viola are often pl <coughs> playing long lines which kind of rise up through through that um, that duet that the violins are playing and then what happens is I wanted the fast music to, to come back to fade back in as if it really was just kind of a window Maybe we were looking out the window of a train or something, and and we witnessed this this beautiful moment between a, a, a mother and her daughter, and then we're back to the activity of life of, of of getting from one place to another. So I started to think, well, this is starting to seem like maybe a kind of um, like a palindromic uh, structure where you know you've got this this first movement, and then you've got the fast infrastructure movement. And then a little uh, vignette within that about the, the just the sort of dance lesson, and then and then the fast music comes back. So I'm starting to see a kind of arch structure to this whole thing. And what happens is that the infrastructure music um, fades, kind of kind of well, it builds up to a moment where that, that's bigger than the first time you heard it, but it does kind of fizzle out, it kind of fades away. And in the last section, it was kind of the most important to me because um, it's where the title of the piece comes from. And it was inspired by um, my trips to Baltimore where I teach at the Peabody Institute. And um, I saw signs um, uh, everywhere at one point, I, they may still be there, um, that said believe. And this was a campaign, it was basically an, uh, an anti-drug campaign, I think, by the city to believe that things could get better in a, in a, in a city which su with such a, um, a serious um, drug addiction problem. And I thought of the Italian, or it's the, the, the Latin word for that, credo, which of course there's been a lot of spiritual music written, um, written on that. And, but I thought it was a, it was a good title for this last section of the piece, which is just about like a kind of non-religious uh, belief and kind of meditation. And um, so that's what happens. Um, and that's what the piece is based on, about just belief in, in, in who we are, a belief in what we can be and what we are at, at our best, what we are um, as, as people, as a country. Um, and so, Again, this prism kind of happens where the, the infrastructure music fades out. But, but again, with these harmonics, you know, this kind of open sound of, of the, we associate with string instruments. Kind of, uh, it's like another world, kind of like a, it could, it could be anything. It's like a blank slate to me. And then on top of that, first violin plays this note that kind of has nothing to do with it. And that develops into 
um, a kind of phrase structure where three of the instruments will hold a chord and then one of them will play a very uh, lyrical line, um, almost a kind of, um, um, well, I'm not sure how to describe it. Um, but I think of it as a meditation um, where each instrument gets to contribute something to this meditation until eventually they all come together in a more um, chorale-like structure. And, and the piece ends there, and it kind of fades to nothing from there. Um, so, and to me, that the, the last section does in some ways rhyme with the first section. So the structure of the whole piece, which is, I think, about, I don't know, 18 minutes long, um, is somewhat of a palindrome that it, it, uh, it, uh, it's an arch in, in structure. And, um, and I, I would say that of this piece, of the pieces I've written, this is one of my most performed just because the Miro Quartet has played it all over the place. And it's, it's such a great honor for me um, every time I hear that they've played it again, um, that it, the, the, the work means something to them and hopefully to uh, the audiences who hear it as well. Um, and I, I don't want to go on too long uh, with this, but um, I know that the, the, the Miro is also playing the uh, beautiful Beethoven Opus 74 quartet on the same concert. And this piece has, has always um, meant a lot to me, um, I think because <laughs> the way it was introduced to me was um, in a composition lesson uh, at the Yale School of Music with my teacher at the time, Martin Bresnik. He was talking about introducing an idea in a piece and having that idea mean something and kind of uh, almost pose a question to the audience when they first hear it. What is that? And, and then, you know, going on about the, the music of the rest of the piece and then returning to that idea as, as, a, as a means of uh, kind of finishing something that that one started as a composer in a certain sense. So, you know, dropping these, these clues for the audience and then hopefully responding to them at some point later so that it, it makes sense. It makes, it makes logical, musical sense to, to the listener. And in the first movement, uh, he talked about this first movement of, of the harp quartet by Beethoven as having these three, these three things which stand out for the, the sort of a, attentive listener. Um, that it begins with a slow introduction, and in that introduction, the first violin, as 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 in my piece Credo, um, is kind of presented as the as the virtuoso first violin, as compared to the other instruments, which are playing much more tame lines. Um, the first violin is kind of uh, you know playing figurations up high and then swooping down low. And there's a sense that it's kind of more important than the rest of the ensemble, at least in this introduction. So that's something that Beethoven was doing on purpose. And then right at the end of this introduction, a very curious um, kind of rising harmonic pattern begins to happen throughout the whole quartet, rising by, by, by half step chromatically kind of an odd and memorable um, choice um, and something, again, which Beethoven knew <laughs> he would eventually have to uh, answer for in the movement. And then the allegro begins. And of course, what you notice is, is the, the, the you know, pizzicato, um, uh, pizzicato is what I think, I believe that's why it's called the harp quartet. I think that's why the nickname is there. Um, but there are those three things that there are the like the pizzicatos and the viola and the cello, which are not just sort of ex, you know not not just uh, trivial, but actually very important um, uh, within the texture of the music. And the piece, so you know, does what sonata forms usually do, which is to um, you know move through this exposition of ideas into a, a development section and then a recapitulation of of those first ideas that are presented. And you're still, as an audience, kind of wondering, well, what about that introduction? You know, is there a way, like, what, what was all that? Was it important or was it just music that we're supposed to forget about? And what Beethoven does, which to me it gives me chills every time I, I hear it, is there's a certain moment where the first violin begins to very uh, uh, energetically play a series of 
arpeggios, rising up, rising up, and, and eventually the, har and the harmonic pattern behind this virtuoso first violin, which Beethoven had introduced in the, in the first section, the harmony begins to rise gradually by step, as it did in that kind of curious uh, moment in the introduction. And we have the pizzicato <laughs> in, the, um, in, the, in the bass as well. And so at this moment, it's like all the ideas, all the most kind of memorable, salient um, ideas that Beethoven introduced all come together in one moment. And it's just so unbelievably satisfying for a listener who's been paying attention at, at this moment when a great composer is able to make it all come together. And I, I, that's that lesson that, that Martin Bresnik uh, gave me uh, ha had such impact. And I probably, I don't think there's a piece that I write that where I don't think about what the possibilities of that and, and that nothing I write should be should be unimportant that if I'm going to write something, assume that it's structurally important somehow, that it's something that if the audience is really listening, I will, I will not sort of let it go, that it'll, it'll, it'll become integral in the structure at some point. So with that, I think I will close. And um, again, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you and um, and always exciting for me um, to, to hear uh, that Credo is being played again by the fabulous Miro Quartet, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>